Welcome to the program. It's a Saturday morning and always great to be with you. And of course, as always, we will be together till 10 o'clock this morning. As always, three amazing guests. We start off by looking at the issue around um, deafness in infants. Is there anything you can do about it? And how do you pick up the fact that your little infant has a hearing disability? Well, uh, Professor Claudine Straubeck from Wits University will be in studio talking to us about high hopes and the support they give to deaf infants and babies. Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravit is an orthodontist. She'll be here to talk about dental health care. But first up, we're going to talk about crime prevention. I'm not quite sure if it's pri crime prevention or how you become savvy so that you can pass the word down your line of communication and make people smarter as far as crime issues are concerned. And to talk to us about this is Penny Stain. She heads up an organization called uh, Making a Difference and the acronym for Making a Difference is MAD. Good morning, Penny. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Julian. Thank you for having me today. Well, I'm very excited to have you here because um, I understand that you've been working in the parks area for many, many years and you're very passionate about stopping petty and other crimes in the area. How did this all start? I also understand, sadly, you had some loved ones yes. who were killed in by criminals yeah and that set you on a path to start making a meaningful difference. Yes, Julie, that was part of it. Um, when I returned to Johannesburg, I knew nothing about crime. Um, returned from where? I came from Cape Town. Okay. And my father had a stroke, so I came up. I said, sons are great, but daughters are better. <laughs> so I was here to, 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 to care for him. And um, it was it was Heritage Day, so I always celebrate Heritage Day as my, this is my month, because I'm, I'm the blessed one to be here. Um, and they broke into my property. Now, the, it, it was the gardener. And he, um, his body language was kind of, he, he obviously wasn't a happy chappy. So, um, but the relative of my domestic worker, um, her, her boyfriend's relative was the guy who was working for me. And so they'd been to my property, they knew the layout, and they came around the house, they wired up Julie's, my, my domestic is my, my helper, my personal assistant, which is what she is. Um, she, um, so she, 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 we live quite far away from each other her, on the property. So if, she, if I scream, she can't hear me. So they wired up her room with a wire coat hanger. I hate wire coat hangers, they're dangerous. And um, they came around and they tried to strangle me. Uh, I hadn't locked the door because I have little dogs and they run in and out, etc. And um, I managed to get a finger in my mouth and I bit, bit like a wild dog. Ooh. Yeah. And uh, then I suddenly realized there were two people in the room because they were going <laughs> to each other. And obviously they were saying, let's get the heck out of here because th this is not fun. Right. <laughs> so um, I don't know whether they wanted to kill me. Um, the police came, Judy, Judy called the police. Um, I shot through there like a wild person. She just stared at the, at the, at the wire coat hanger and um, the police came and they came from Randburg. So um, they got me to laugh or I've got them to laugh. I'm not quite sure which one. And when they were leaving, um, I then started to try and get a case number. Sorry, no, nothing on attempted murder. Then I tr try, try the station, try that station. And eventually I thought, you know what? I've got my antiretrovirals. I've got my teeth because they were threatening to fall out. I've got my life. 
I don't need the police. I don't need a case number, okay? So <laughs> I was a busy girl in those days, and the phones are ringing and everybody's calling. And this was how long ago? 2001. Okay. And um, so eventually I get this, this, this uh, captain, he says, Mrs. Stain, you actually fall under Porkview. I said, Porkview? Porkview is very far from where I live. <laughs> he said, I said, thank you so much for telling me that. Then I get this constable. Now, Julie, honestly, this man changed my life completely. Um, he said it three times. He said, if you've got a problem, I need to know about it. Julie, I, I love this man more than I love myself, Lucky Comella. He's no longer a police officer. I think sometimes in the police, when you're really, really good at something, they're not going to promote you because nobody can do that job. So... Um, he was popping in and out of, 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 of my home, watching me writing some of my books on, on the job of looking for a job and qualities that lead to promotion and, and so on. And he went to his station command and said, we need Penny Stain. We must All right, have him. so let's fast forward. You are now involved, so you involved in training, involved in motivational speaking. Yes. And the training I'm talking is pr crime prevention training. Yes. How did you put that together and who is it targeted at? Well, when sector management became alive, okay, which I think is fantastic, um, the the uh, Comella was a, was the sector manager, and um, they had started with the community police forum, uh, the domestic workers watch, and um, so it was the CPF chairman and the sector manager, and when I looked at this, they said to me, "We want you on the CPF executive committee." So I joined that. They bullied me into it. I might add. Anyway, um, and. I, I, I said, okay, I, I can do the, the, this crime, you know, teaching crime prevention to domestics and gardeners, right? Um, but not, I can't to, do not to householders, why not? No, to everybody. Oh, okay. To everybody. It really doesn't matter where you go because the, the unfortunate thing is that most people don't know any better and that's not acceptable. Um, uh, the rule when I teach the domestics, now they're the most important people in our community, in my opinion, because they walk the streets, they know who belongs there, they know what's unusual, they, they, there's a grapevine amongst them. We need to treat them with absolute respect. So I am very blessed. This is my 17th year of teaching them every single month, and some of them have got up to 17 certificates from me. So I reward them with certificates. It's a bit of bribery, to be frank with you, just to keep getting them to come to the list. All right, so let's talk about the training. How long does it take? Where do you roll it out? And what sort of costs are involved? Um, uh, first of all, I've written, I'm now on my 70th lesson that I've written. Uh, so they always get a written handout. Um, it takes an hour, sometimes a little over the hour. Sometimes I do three lessons in a, in a day. So it starts at 10, the next one at 12. So I have to be fairly close to those areas to be able to get from one to the other. I register everybody. Um, and my own helper, personal assistant, uh, helps me as well. Um, in fact, she has actually presented lessons for me when yeah. I landed up in hospital. And I would just give her the storytelling because I don't read the lessons to them, Julie. They, they can read that themselves. But I give them a rule and I say to them, you've got to be able to share this with your employers. Tell them the stories I'm telling you today. Storytellings, whether they're good or bad, are always the things that will stick with them. But so the storytelling has to do with criminal activity in, everything, in the area. Everything to do with crime. Anything that hurts, harms or kills is my concern so that's what I've written about and and created um, I just didn't want little tea parties little tea parties is where they started in somebody's backyard and I'm thinking no 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 no. if we're going to do this thing let's go big let's go big in fact we should be going into every corner of South Africa I wish I've got a long wish list like this I wish I could teach other people to earn an income from it what about school children? Do you oh, not think you yes, should be targeting please. them as well? Yes. 
mm -hmm. high school children, mm. uh, grade 10, 11, 12s, I think mm. are, are a prime target where we should be going. It's also the embassies. I mean, when people are coming into the country, whether they're here for a short stay or a longer stay, uh, we should be in those embassies forewarning people that are, what, what kind of thing and how to look after themselves. And Because um, it's all about making sure that you're safe. So there's, n there's never a moment in our lives that we can just relax and say, if I get a police officer coming to one of my lessons and say, no, well, it's all fine now. We, there's no, no, there's no, been not much crime. And I'm going, don't start relaxing in your slacks. Because trust me, what happens here today is going to happen there tomorrow. Okay, hold that thought. We'll come back to you right after the ad sure. break. Penny Stain is from an organization called MAD, Making a Difference. And she's here to teach us, our domestics, our gardeners, our children and mm. ourselves as well, on how to protect ourselves against criminality. Stay yes. with us. We'll continue after the ad break. Penny Stain, who is very, very entertaining, I must say, is here talking to us about crime prevention training. She lives in Parkmore. She's been in the area for many, many years, and she believes that the crime rate, petty crime as well, in uh, the greater Johannesburg area is getting out of hand. And we know that recently the crime stats were released in South Africa, and they are truly very, very worrying. But let's hear about how we can ensure our safety and the safety of our loved ones. So give us a few key pointers that we should be observing to be safer in our homes and in the areas that we live in. Well, first of all, the criminals love it when the domestics are there because they can give them a, a, a guided tour of the house, okay. right? Um, but there are crime signs and it's not an urban legend that they they put signs outside. The criminals are leaving are very organized. I'm talking there are two types. You get the crime of, of, of opportunity because you and I are not smart enough to prevent it or leave the gate open. I mean gates are very dangerous. It only needs to be open that far. I interviewed a guy who was in, in prison for fifteen years. He was a shocking criminal. And he said, we used to watch them and we could see how they were getting their keys out. And then we knew where they were and they're listening in the street and they, they, they get the name of the people and they, they come and they, uh, and then they park two blocks up and then they st start opening. Uh, as soon as she, she gets there, they, they, they put their finger through the gate and the gate opens up again. And then he also said what he did in his, in his gang was he had a proposer. So sometimes they start with the domestics and they say, you know, the guy, my honey pie. <laughs> you know, when they're sitting around and they're all chatting away, etc., etc. Nothing wrong with that, but we have to be so careful about what we talk about. That includes our employers. Um, you know, when you've got an unfortunate situation with um, a disgruntled domestic, it is extremely dangerous. I went to Laudium courtesy of Yusuf Abramji, and there was, a, there was a lady there who was actually hacked to death. I mean, they chopped her up. Oh. With, I think the domestic was definitely involved, and she ran away with the two criminals that came. She was just coming out the bathroom when they chopped her up. Um, you know, this is just, uh, I, I have no idea how that could have happened. All right, let's talk about what we ought to be wary about. What are the type of things we should be looking out for? Um, first of all, we've got, to, we've got, you know, we're the fortunate ones. The domestics and gardeners don't have their own security companies, but you, your security company is important. You also need to have your patrolling vehicle number in your particular area, right? Now, I have a book that is filled with the whole of Gauteng, uh, all the patrolling numbers of the police. And they know your area. So you'll get two patrolling vehicles in, in, in a sector. A sector is made up of suburbs. And um, so if you put it on speed dial and you press your panic button at the same time, you're going to get 
the people the to get you. The other thing is we've got to make sure they can find you. If they don't know where you are, you can't hear a shout, help, help, help. If, if, if you if don't nobody. give an address. Well, it, it's not just the address. You need to know the closest, you need to know the uh, closest crossroad to you, um, the, um, um, uh, um, the what do you call them? The schools, mm. the, the, those kind of things. And if you go past the, or if you're facing, you're on Ravonia and you're facing Sunning Hill, you turn left into, you've got to be able to, I give them all a, a document on that. Um, we've also got to be very careful with our domestics that we treat them with respect. Because, because if we don't, they have a score to settle with you. Without question, mm -hmm. without question. Mm -hmm. I mean, that recent story, um, I did um, a, a lesson on um, um, child, uh, child trafficking. Um, uh, that was last, not last month, the month before. And um, one domestic went walkabout with a nine-month-old baby. And I phoned Yogi at the Santon police station and she said, Ben, do you know this story? I said, no. She says, well, it's every." So I, she said, I said, Yogi, was it a white baby or a black baby? So she said, does it matter? I said, no, it doesn't matter. Um, I just need to know. And the reason I wanted to know was that she never came back with the baby. She, the, baby the, the baby was found in a black township, in a black household, and some clever person out there spotted a white child where they shouldn't be. Right. Okay. And that's how they managed to catch them. Okay. Because of time constraints, what yes. else can you tell us that's important that we need to remember? And, you know, common sense prevails in an emergency. Okay. Um, in, if, if there's a medical emergency, um, you need to... Uh, know which numbers to call. Um, the the other thing that's so important, Julie, and I just have to bring this into our conversation. The biggest problem that the police have is lack of information. It's not manpower. It's not cars. So um, if we don't come up with information, and it doesn't have to be the whole story. It you know even if it's a tip, because there was a situation in 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 Bedford View. And the domestic was tied up with the, with the, with the husband, etc. And she, she she started. I said, talk to your your attackers, but do as you're told. Don't try and get clever with them, because you're inviting trouble. So um, she said, and a little bit too tight. Uh, and she, she her English wasn't good. They asked her where the where the safe was. She said, it's in the kitchen. So off they toddled to Ina you know, and she loosened her hands and she managed to, because she'd been coming to my lessons, she managed to press her panic button, but they got away. All right. The what? next day, yes. she saw them next door. So okay. we've got to watch out for each other. Okay. We should be, we should be going with whistles. Yeah. If we're going to walk, uh, we've got to teach panic our children. Panic buttons as well. Panic buttons, panic mm -hmm. buttons. Mm -hmm. Everybody should have a panic and button. And why should we send our domestics and our gardeners for these uh, crime prevention sessions? Because you're going uh, to sessions. change their approach. You're going to change their attitudes. They are the managing director of that property when they are in the property. And I tell them, I'm not here to teach you to look after madams and masters. I'm here to teach you to look after yourself. And when you look after yourself, you look after everybody else around you. And I want you to take responsibility. So payday, payday is a good day. I like payday because everybody will remember now. Madam, you and I, we're going to walk around the house. We're going to check all the panic buttons. We're going to check the perimeter of the property to see that there's no tree that's hanging over. Uh, we're going to check all these things. We're going so to we check need to do that on a regular basis? Every month. You okay. should be phoning your security company and saying, I'm going to just press the panic buttons to just see that everything's in working order. Okay. okay. So, um, and and they should be they should be carrying a panic button mm. on them. All right. You also spoke about uh, signs uh, yes, left outside signs. your house, which yes. is not an urban legend. What sort it's of right. signs are we talking about? Oh, um, Lord. Uh, Bottles a, filled with water, everything. crisp packets. You name it. So if if you see anything, you know, I I would just think it's litter or garbage. What should one it's do not. when you see something on your property or outside you of your property? You must pick it up immediately and throw it away. Yeah. Or do you call the police? 
No, well, no, don't call the police because they'll think that you're mad. Well, so what do you do with the you, stuff that you see outside well, your property? You just pick it up and take it, uh, take it away from where okay. it's sitting. All okay. right. Because what is it that you're trying to show me? I was trying to find the one on, because I've actually got Okay, don't worry things. about that. Just right. talk me through it. Okay. Um, yeah. I okay, mean, so for people who are wanting to uh, attend the cause, I'm thinking perhaps I should come with my helper. So yes. both my helper and I get the same message. When, Absolutely. how do we um, get in touch with you to uh, give us lessons or attend the course? You know what the idea would be, Julie, is to do a Saturday morning um, on uh, from, say, 9 o'clock until 12.30. Um, invite the security, invite the police and Mad Penny. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a few and people in the neighborhood. Everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's do it together. All right. This is a togetherness thing. Mm. Bring your domestics. Bring your people. I should be going into the corporate companies right. on a Friday, the Mufti mm -hmm. day on a Friday morning and get them there at seven o'clock in the morning till 8.30. I will teach them every single month. It's but a that does, process. Why do they need to come to you every single because month? Because every lesson is different. Okay, so how many lessons does one have to go through? There's no stopping it. So you come up with a new concept every time every they're with you? Every single time. I, okay, I don't repeat a lesson in four okay, years. Okay, we've got two minutes to wrap up. Uh, talk to us about the, uh, you were a nominee for the Businesswoman of the Year Award. Yes. What was that all about? Well, somebody thought I was great or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, there was another one, another award that I got. Uh, it came from the... Um, um, South Af the Southern Africa Trust and I, uh, Drivers of Change mm -hmm. Award, so that was another one. And I worked with um, the Shout Foundation um, and I worked with Yusuf, as you know. Um, but unfortunately, that crime line, um, the 32211 is, is a thing of the past. That's a very sad situation um, because I was always punting them. Um, but I think if they know, you know, everybody should have ice in their phones and that piece of paper that I hand out to every newcomer has got all the, um, every piece of information that you could ever wish to have. If your domestic is attacked or hurt or harmed, we know, need the family member to get to them. I stands for in case of emergency. And I, she needs to know my ice and I need to know her ice. If it's on the paper in the house, then we need to be able to, to, to contact and, and know what to do and get the people to help us. Your closing remarks to our viewers all over the country and beyond, what would the soundest piece of advice be that you'd like to leave us with? Treat your domestics and gardeners with respect. Treat them as very special people. I, I love them. They are precious beyond words. They are, the, they are there. The amount that they do for us, Julie, is just phenomenal. They're there for our convenience to make our lives easier. And if we treat them with the respect accorded to them, yeah. they will then take care of our health and Without well-being, question. I should imagine. If not, they'll know they where are... your medication is. Right. If there's a medi medical emergency, they'll know where your medic. You must know where her medication, if it's not, not Panado. Life saving. We've got to stop there. Thank you indeed for being with us today. You're um, obviously, um, if you don't treat them with respect, then they're going to come back and settle a score with you. But well, if it's not directly, Julie, mm -hmm. it'll be through somebody else. Right. Say, you know what? If they do the wada wada, it's normal. If something's not nice, they're going to tell anybody who'll flip and listen to them. Okay? That's extremely dangerous. You see, we're fighting a war of information. And if we don't pass information on to the police, right? We are, and it, it doesn't have to be just a tip, right? If, 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 we can't, if we can help the police, we've got to start working with the police. The police are never going to win the crime war without the community knowing what to do and what not to do. Well, thank you for being with us and continue your amazing oh, you. fight. Mad, uh, making a difference, a penny stain. I think you have your heart in the right place. <laughs> thank you very much, Julie. There you have it. A very entertaining guest, I might add. She speaks with passion and anything and everything she uh, obviously takes on is with much passion. 
and she's here to talk about how to protect yourself against a criminality and also to treat your helpers, your domestic work and gardeners and anybody else that provides a service for you with the utmost of respect because if you don't, there will be scores to settle. Mm. Don't go away. Still to come is Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravid to talk dental health care and later on we're going to talk to an organization called High Hopes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome back. And now in studio we have Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravid. She is a dentist. She's going to be talking to us about dental care and or obviously um, oral hygiene. The importance of it, I think. Dental hygiene is taken for granted, but if we don't take good care of our mouths and our teeth, the re repercussions can be huge. But before we get to the dental care part of the interview, I just also need to introduce the other work that this amazing young lady does. She's the Executive Secretary of the Mdeni Muslim Association. Uh, she'll tell us what exactly is it that she, her father, uh, brother-in-law and sister so it's a family association and they've been very very involved in this association for many many years and they've been doing this work absolutely unfailingly and to add to that she's also the South African National Women's Forum chair of the Houghton Wing and then she runs her own online clothing business and like I said she's a practicing dentist and a mother of three children so I just wonder where and how she finds the time and energy to do all of this. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thanks so much for having me on your show today. I'm so glad you're here and really I have to ask you the question where and how do you manage to do all of this? I mean I'm sure you are a multitasker, but still, this is a huge, huge, huge undertaking. I think you really need a very good support structure, especially being a mother of three kids. And as you know, moms have so much on their hands as it is. So shukr alhamdulillah, my mom helps me a lot. And I have understanding uh, kids and a husband, because sometimes they also feel it because my life is so busy, but you could with Allah's help, you put so much of Padaka in your time and you manage to juggle everything together. Alhamdulillah. Tell us a little bit about uh, the Mdeni Muslim uh, Association. Now, I became aware of it when uh, my nephew got married into oh, your yes. family and we started learning about the amazing work your dad and the rest of the family are involved in. Okay, so the Mdeni Muslim Association started about 30 years ago. Sure. My father, he is a medical doctor in Soweto, so he's been a doctor for 30 years. So MDN is in the heart of Soweto. At that time, there weren't any Muslims in the area as such. So that's when the townships were burning and people were in and out of the surgery and wounded patients my dad was treating. So one at a time, he started telling them about Islam. Mashallah. And shukr alhamdulillah, they started embracing and people weren't really doing dawah in the townships. Till today you'll see the townships are quite neglected, but for 30 years he's been trying. And um, we started with one person and now we like over about 500 Muslim shukr alhamdulillah. Mashallah, may Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your dad and all of you yeah. that are involved with good health and long life to carry on this amazing legacy and it is absolutely a legacy. Okay. I also know that every Ramadan without fail you people put on a mass iftar and you also give out um, hundreds of uh, hampers as well. Yeah, so what we normally do during Ramadan, we um, put together iftar and seri hampers because people come to MDN. We at the moment just have a Jamaat Kana. We have collected money for a plot to build a masjid. Inshallah. And the plot, shukr alhamdulillah, has been transferred. So now it's just to build the masjid on there. And um, 
the response has been phenomenal especially during Ramadan to help us make these hampers because as I said we don't have enough funds it's a family run um, association so you need a lot of help and manpower to also sustain it so it has been going well during Ramadan but we still need ongoing help throughout the year because during the year daily there's madras class classes for kids and adults and then we also have sandwich drives and we're trying to on a uplift. daily basis yes okay. so we're trying to uplift the community so i think it's a responsibility that we need to undertake and carry on with now alhamdulillah yeah. and may you grow from strength to strength mm -hmm. amazing work that your dad and the family are undertaking and i I, I'm blown away when I hear things like no, this. Okay. Now, not only are you guys involved with MDENI, you're also involved with the South African Muslim Women's Forum. Yes, so the South African National Muslim Women's Forum I recently joined. So whatever projects they undertake, I also assist with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the Houghton Wing, I'm in uh, the chair of the Houghton Wing. Fundraisers yes, and fundraisers. anything and everything else yes. that needs to be done. Yeah. So basically, we're not just affiliated with one organization. So any organization that needs help, we try to assist. Be it Gift of the Givers, Alim Dad, CI projects. Recently, we also launched the Pink High Tea, which mm -hmm. we want to carry on yearly, make it a yearly initiative. So women supporting women locally and abroad. And of so, course, all of the monies go to the neediest yes, of the needy. Yeah. So we don't only want to do international charities. There's a need also to help people locally. Mm -hmm. So I just feel as a medical professional, it's my responsibility to uplift humanity. Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. Um, just one more word on Mdeni. Um, I know it's a family-run association and I know you guys have been doing a marvellous job right up to now. But if people from outside of the community or other community members would like to get involved, is there space for them to get involved and how would you like the support from the community? Yes, so the community at large, um, they can get in touch with me. Whenever we do have programs, uh, we have been telling people about it and they've come on board. Um, the Houghton Muslim Academy as well help us quite a bit, especially during Ramadan and Eid. And they give Eid hampers to the kids and the adults. And people in the community themselves, just individuals, have come on board. And even monthly, they've been giving Zakat and Lila contributions as we do take Zakat and Lila. And uh, we've been using that. That's what we've been using to run the association. Because like I said, it's an ongoing, it's a daily thing. So we need funds continuously. Inshallah, yeah. by way of this program, we do hope that we'll be opening up hearts and deep pockets. Inshallah. But of course you're here, and I couldn't resist that. I needed to talk about the association yes. and the type of work you and the family are involved in. And may you grow from strength Inshallah. to strength. Uh, an important thing, oral dental health. As a practitioner yourself, would you agree it's a very neglected part of our regime, our healthcare regime? Yes, I think people take it for granted, but they don't really realize that oral health is closely linked to your overall health. So when you think of your mouth, you need to think of your whole body, but people just don't realize the close link that it has. We kind of think we wake up in the morning, brush our teeth and yes. off we go. And then just before going to bed at night, another brush up and possibly a bit of flossing, yes. which also has been introduced recently. When I say recently, over perhaps the past five or 10 years, uh, we didn't know about flossing as, you know, as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. How important is that? I and mean, is brushing twice a day good enough? Yes, so I think the basic oral hygiene regime that people should follow is your brushing twice a day. So in the morning and the most important at night, because during the day you're eating, you're snacking. So all the sugars in that we need to brush at night and most people don't brush at night. Flossing also is really important because with a toothbrush uh, between your teeth, whatever is left behind doesn't tend to come out and that results in cavities between your teeth. So with the floss, the, um, whatever particles are stuck, they do tend to come out. So flossing, a lot of people are lazy to floss. <laughs> 
<laughs> Most of my patients, when they come into our rooms, they say they don't floss. But also now things have changed so much. Even if you're lazy, you get what's called the aqua floss or the water flosses. Oh wow! Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you feel it's time consuming to floss, but it really isn't. It mm -hmm. barely takes a minute to even Is floss. Is the aqua floss as effective as the? Yes. Yeah, so uh, aqua floss is a machine where water comes out at really high speed, ah. and um, just between your teeth, you just flush out whatever needs to be out, mm -hmm. and at least it's something that you're doing which is like flossing. Now, for him, it's okay for us. We understand yeah. how to go about as adults to floss our teeth. Yeah. But how do you teach uh, children, uh, toddlers, yes. for example? Is it important for them to floss as well, or would we as parents have to do it for them? So for toddlers, they don't need to floss. Um, they still have their baby teeth. I think once the permanent teeth start coming out, then um, like you. Patients should come every six months for their dental checkup. The little ones, yeah, obviously. So normally they say when your first tooth is out, but that is a little bit early. So in our experience, at least from about three years of age, the kids are a little bit more easier to speak to and more willing to even sit in the chair because uh, people are so afraid of oh, coming absolutely. to the dentist. <laughs> I think their blood pressures go up True. and then they make the kids afraid. So from three years, you should start bringing the kids in just for a general checkup just so they start getting used to and becoming more accustomed to coming to the dentist. So when they come, we just have a look at their teeth and we make it a pleasant experience, a child-friendly experience. And then we show them how to brush their teeth. So initially it's just the brushing that we show them. And then um, if we need to do a polishing, we just do that for them. When they get a little bit older, and like I said, when the permanent teeth start coming out, then we start teaching them how to floss. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you've got to do that for life, yes. as you do with your, the brushing of your yeah. teeth. So I think a big thing is parents, they um, neglect oral health. Mm -hmm. Things have changed so much over the years. So a lot of people still think it's like in the old days where people just use, the dentist just took out your tooth. Whereas now we're concentrating more on prevention preserving. and preserving yes. those teeth. Just, yeah. we're going for an ad break now, but very quickly, I know that in Ramadan, we as Muslims like to use, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of forego the yes. toothbrush and yeah. we use the miswak. Right. Is that a good option? Yeah, so the miswak is excellent to use. People use it on a daily basis as well. But because nowadays the foods are so processed and refined, you should use it in conjunction with a toothbrush and toothpaste. Okay, let's go for our yeah. first ad break. When we come back, we'll talk some more on um, dental health and hygiene. Uh, Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravitz in studio with us talking about the importance of having a pretty solid dental regime in place. If not, you are looking for, uh, for, for, for problems. And of course, I'm talking dental problems later on in life. Don't go away. We're going to continue this discussion. Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravitz in studio with us. She's locally based and she's talking to us about oral health, good solid regime oral health, because if we don't instill it in our children now, they're going to have huge problems later on in life. And that is in fact right, because if you don't start at an early enough age, you're going to have lots of problems with cavities, uh, probably losing of teeth, and then you've got to go the extreme routes like crowning, um, fillings, yes. implants. So I think mums play such a vital role because they are the primary caregivers of the children. So daily, even if your kids are lazy to brush, you need to Insist. assist them and mm -hmm. you also need to do it for them. Mm -hmm. And once you start playing an active part in their oral health, automatically they will also take an interest in it. And you as a parent, every six months should make sure that you bring your kids in. 
you yourself should also come in. Once, so, in, once a so year? So every once... six months, oh. <laughs> your kids end. So for kids right. and adults. So uh-huh. even if there's nothing wrong with your teeth, because sometimes we don't realize the impact it has, as I said, on your general health. Mm. So you need to come in. I've been told that if you have a very bad uh, dental health um, or haven't taken care of your teeth over the years, the impact, um, you can impact your heart health and possibly even diabetes. Would yes, that be a correct assumption? Thing, yes. Um, our mouth is full of bacteria. So normally we keep it under control with our daily oral hygiene by brushing and flossing and mouthwash and all of that. But once you start neglecting your teeth, these bacteria can actually enter the bloodstream. Mm, yeah. And once it starts entering the bloodstream, it can impact on your heart, diabetes, all of that. And patients that are diabetic, if they have any dental infection, the sugar levels just go out of control. So even to monitor and maintain your sugar for the diabetics, they need to make sure their oral hygiene is intact as well. Fahima, let's talk about gum disease. Is this something only prevalent in older people? Should we be worried about gum disease in little children? And if it does present in younger, in younger people, what would be the cause of it? Okay, so gum disease, uh, 90% of people at some stage in their life has experienced gum disease. So usually because it's painless, people don't realize they actually have gum disease. But if you start seeing that your gums are bleeding when you're brushing and that, you need to start thinking that this is the initial stage of gum disease. Patients that normally come regularly for dental checkups and that are meticulous the oral hygiene at home, they will see that their gums hardly tend to bleed. But those that are a bit neglectful, you will start seeing that um, you are having a little bit of gingivitis that's if coming on. If you don't yeah. treat it, what would that outcome look like? So um, gum disease, if not treated, usually progresses to a more rapid infection, which we call periodontitis periodontitis. Periodontitis, it affects the bone as Ooh. well as the gums. Mm-hmm. So over the years, what happens is that the bone levels start decreasing and your tooth starts losing support from inside. And you only start seeing the effects when you're older, when those teeth actually start getting loose and they eventually fall out and you can't really save those teeth. Mm -hmm. So it's a process that actually goes on and you don't see the effects immediately. That's why a lot of people take it for granted. But later in life, they actually see what was the actual outcome of it. And obviously, if you don't exercise good oral health, you're also going to have issues around bad breath. Yes. So um, bad oral health actually impacts on your self-esteem, your social well-being. People also, you know, when you have a toothache, you can't function, you can't concentrate. (laughs) True. So there's numbers of days missed from work, children miss school. So it really impacts on your social well-being. So you need to take care of your oral health. Also, your smile is not attractive. If you go for job interviews, it impacts on that. And uh, as you said, bad breath. Which and you is just, a, obviously, you're so self-conscious yes. about it, and yet you don't do anything yeah. about so it. So I think like your mouth is the window of your body. True. And the first thing a person notices is your smile, or even your breath if you're near a person, mm, mm. and if you don't have a nice breath. Mm, mm. It's something which is not socially acceptable. Mm-hmm. And yeah. people are going to avoid yes. you. People who do suffer from bad breath, uh, for example, let's assume that they do have a healthy regime in place, oral okay. regime. How can they treat that? Okay, so we need to also see what could be causing the bad breath. So you need to go to your dentist and see, is it a cavity that might be causing you to have bad breath? A lot of people that suffer from sinus problems, which most uh, people do, could also suffer from bad breath. Mm -hmm. Uh, So like I said, there could be a number of factors that could be causing it. And is there any, any uh, I know lots of people revert to, uh, or, or take gums to freshen their breath, yeah. but is there any 
kind of uh, almost a, a natural alternative apart from being very vigilant with your um, uh, dental hygiene is there anything that one could take on a daily basis to always ensure whether you do or don't suffer from bad breath to ensure that you're always pleasant to be close to okay so i think something that's really natural to use uh, in place of a mouthwash is your warm water and salt rinses so after you brush you can rinse with that and um, generally that could keep your mouth nice and clean and fresh yes okay what should parents be looking out for the three possibly um, very common problems as far as uh, dental health is concerned what should they be focusing on okay so a lot of the kids they tend to sleep with bottles in their mouth when they're babies and this has a really devastating effect on baby's teeth eventually they get what's called nursing bottle caries where all the front teeth are decayed and um, that is something that moms should really see to so you should try to wean your kids off as soon as possible from the bottle and they should start drinking from a sippy cup and um, they should avoid any sugary drinks even formulas try to limit it in the bottle especially for the nighttime feeds and um, they should actually make sure that the kids um, you, you could even use a wipe or to wipe their teeth before they go to bed because a lot of the kids sleep with a bottle in their mouth so the parents should try to wipe their teeth and brush it Dis just to keep it despite them having the bottle yes. in their mouth yeah what about dummies i've been told that it um, protrudes the, the teeth okay so the dummies and thumb sucking is uh, usually a pacifier for the kids so initially they could do that but you need to make sure that above four years it does not carry on because if Eventually what happens is kids develop an overbite That's right. and uh, they get malalignment of their teeth and um, it really is a problem and eventually they need orthodontic treatment in that. Now we know yeah. the big thing with little children is a lot of children maybe 50% or more children at some point in their lives will go for um, orthodontic treatment yeah. for braces to straighten their teeth mm. to fix their bites and a whole host more yeah. but I've also noticed these days that a lot of adults um, are wearing braces is it good practice why would they be doing it and is it safe I mean at this late stage in their lives is the braces going to help it all straighten the teeth or the bite or whatever it is that they go uh, that they're using it for Okay, so I think a lot of people are now getting more aesthetically conscious. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So the thing is, it's not only aesthetics of your face or your hair right. and that. So they actually want nice, bright, straight smiles, you okay. know. Okay. So initially, it was just kids that would have orthodontic treatment, but now more and more adults are coming into our practices. And is it effective? Yes, no, it is. As long as they're compliant, uh -huh. um, so the those that do opt to go for the braces, they actually quite compliant with treatment and the results are quite good. So it doesn't matter what age you actually do it, but it will have good results. We've yeah. only got two minutes to the end of the interview and I have so many more yeah. questions for you, but very quickly, a lot of people use um, toothpaste which claim to whiten the teeth right. be they smokers or all the colored food coffee drinkers yes. you know their teeth do start discoloring yeah. is that advisable or do you have do you have other okay, information? So we actually do also sell whitening toothpaste in our practice so those toothpaste they actually just brighten your teeth not really whiten it as such if you really want white teeth you need to come in for professional bleaching into our rooms and the results are really good so with the whitening toothpaste it's very temporary the results but um, if you want more permanent results you need to do the professional bleaching in our room we've only taken a yeah. small bite of the topic today i think you're going to have to come <laughs> in again in future to talk some more and go into lots more detail mm -hmm. but in the meantime thank you indeed for being with us and we do hope all of you have a really really smiley day that's all i can say thank you
Welcome back. And it certainly has been a morning of amazing women. We had uh, the Stain lady talking about crime prevention or the classes she gives in uh, crime prevention in your immediate vicinity. We had the lovely Dr. Fahima Ismail Ravid talking dental care and also uh, the Family Social Responsibility Initiative. We now have Professor Claudine, Claudine Storbeck. She's from Wits University and she's here to talk to us about the Wits Centre for Deaf Studies and particularly about high hopes and how they are changing the lives and the hopes of parents of infant babies who have a problem with hearing. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, amazing work you guys are doing. You've been at WITS uh, for a while and you've been at the Centre for Deaf Studies. Yes. Why are you so passionate about it? This is the reason God put me on earth, is to work with deaf people. It's all I've ever wanted to do. And if I couldn't do this, I'd probably just sit at home doing nothing. There is nothing else I want to do with my life. How long have you been doing this work? So I've been at WITS for 20 years at oh. the Centre for Deaf Studies. I know it's gone so fast. And then before WITS, um, I was a teacher of the deaf at St. Vincent School for the Deaf in Johannesburg for about five, six years. So was there a family member perhaps that was deaf and this propelled you into this direction? No, not at all. I had no connection with deafness. It was just something I knew I wanted to do from small. Um, and I cheated with my parents and they were so respectful of it. They, they didn't just pushed me aside as if it was a phase I was going through. My dad bought me my first book in sign language when I was about nine. Um, no, this has just been what I've always wanted to do. Good on you. I think you are <laughs> truly touching lives in a very positive way. Thanks. Now, you, Vitz has introduced something called High Hopes. I think yes. it's about how many years in the High running? High Hopes is 12 years old. And you having the anniversary this Friday? Yes. All right, brilliant. Good luck and congratulations Thank you. on the staying power as far as High Hopes is concerned. But High Hopes yes. has come about to give parents a lot of hope yes. as far as their infant children are concerned. Mm. How did this start and what is this hope that we're talking about as far as infants are concerned? Yeah, so if, what, if you've had your own child, think back to those first few months of absolute shock and horror that you didn't know what you were going to have. It's scary to wake up in the middle of the night and, and just the emotions and the hormones. Now imagine that little Baba has also got a disability and is now a disability that impacts on communication. They can't hear you sing. They can't hear you just communicate with them. And that just propels parents into deep depression. It's traumatic. It affects the whole family, the siblings. And then that impacts everything going forward. And it's, it's the human right of a parent, of a child with a disability, and particularly deafness, um, to have that support that they need just to have a normal life with their tiny baby. So then High Hope was, Hopes was formed 12 years ago. Yes. How did you roll it out to the community? And how does a parent, in this day and age, yeah. if you're on medical aid, you're lucky, mm. uh, the child goes through a whole battery of tests mm. shortly after it's born, and these things are picked up. Mm. But what about the more marginalized families or a mother who doesn't pick up yeah. that my child has a hearing disability? Yeah. Um, I suppose, first of all, we, we, we started in Gauteng because that's where I happen to work. So we started in Gauteng and the aim of the program is to train local people. So we train people in Soweto, Lanasia, Pretoria to then support families at the local in those clinics. local areas, not at the local clinics, it's home based. So we go to your, the home for free to go and support parents. In fact, in South Africa, it doesn't really matter if you're in public health or private health no one has been testing the ears of infants. It's been a kind of an ad hoc, if you're lucky that there's an audiologist in your area that's been donating time or offering the service. So we've had families with private health, public health, all of them fall through the cracks. And um, we find them later. And that is a huge, huge problem. So what we've also been doing in addition to just supporting families in the homes, we've been lobbying private health, we've been lobbying public health to just get screening on board 
because really it's done in every developed country in the world. Newborn screening for ears and eyes, in addition to all the tests they're already doing. But I, I took it for granted mm. that it is done. Obviously, like I said, if you're lucky enough to have medical aid, it's mm. going to happen. No. Is, is it not? Um, it's not part of the package at all. Mm. Um, You've even, got to request it. And even if you request it, if that hospital doesn't have an audiologist that has already offered the services, or if they offer it, they don't offer it universally. So they might offer it twice a week. If you're the lucky one to have a baby born on a Tuesday, you're dis discharged on Wednesday, Thursday, and the audiologist isn't there, it's not done. Okay, so what you are, what I am hearing your suggestion is that if you have a newborn baby, ask for those tests yes. to be carried out. Yes. But now, if you're in the public sector, mm. in the state hospital, you mm. can't mm. you can't demand these services. Yeah. What do you suggest those women do? Yes. Um, there are a lot of local clinics that have audiologists, but the main thing is use your six week inoculation as the time that you engage with your nurses. Because by six weeks, all the fluid is drained from the ears and parents can already start having a sense that there might be something wrong. But at the six week to actually ask for some form of screening and from tertiary to secondary hospitals, they even in the public health sector ha will have access to screening. Okay, um, what will they pick up? Are there any signs mm. or symptoms that mom has to look out for yes. to perhaps uh, convey to the medical practitioner mm. just to mm. make his or her screening that much easier and to know what they're looking for? Yeah. So number one, I would say for a mom and dad, granny, any caregiver to follow their gut. So before I can even give you any advice, it's just very often they just know and they can't put their finger on it. So even if you've got no proof and you don't know why, insist that they take your gut seriously. But the type of thing we look at is children will babble a lot, even deaf children, until about the age of five, six months. They either stop babbling or their babbling becomes very monotone. So instead of the la, ah, they become ba ba ba. The immediately, if they become quiet after five, six months or their babbling changes, that's first alert. Secondly, if your child doesn't startle at sleep time to either lightning and thunder, to pots falling when they're asleep, don't just think your baby's a good sleeper. They should startle. They should get frights. They should cry in the middle of the night. Um, thirdly, often these kids look so alert that even if your gut is telling you, oh, there's something that's worrying me, they very often look around because they're so vis visual. So they overcompensate. Oh. They notice your shadow. They notice the vibration on the wooden floor. So then parents will go, I really thought there was a hearing problem, but she's so alert. She looked around, she saw me. So they overcompensate with other things. So when they're not typically turning around while they're crawling and you call them down the passage or the first or the second time you call them and they're not turning around and they're not engrossed in a toy, you know, just follow your gut and then just monitor babbling, first words. You know, if they're starting to copy, ma 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 ma, ma 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 ma, da da da, la la. Or if they're not copying typically, and sometimes children are not profoundly deaf, there's a small hearing loss. And for us to remind parents that even that is significant. And sometimes they're just missing some sounds. A child who speaks funny, their little speech is so funny, and initially we think it sounds cute, but if it doesn't self correct, it might be indicative of if that's what they're hearing. They hear funny, so they speak funny. So mom picks up that there's something wrong with this little one. Yeah. Takes the child to these clinics that yes. you're talking about. Mm. What's going to happen there? I presume the assessment is carried out. Mm. Depending on the severity of the hearing loss, yes. what's going to happen? Okay. What sort of systems, support systems yes. are being put in place by your department mm. to make sure that that child is going to meet his milestones yes. and is going to be as regular yes. as all the children around him. Okay, great question. So the first thing is they will get a tiny little test done called the OAE, a little probe is popped in the Baba's ear, they can be awake or asleep, and it's a very quick little test. If they confirm that there is a hearing loss, even before hearing aids, even before they know how significant the loss, ask the audiologist or clinic to refer to High Hopes. If they don't refer, check online and find us yourself and you can self-refer. So while they're getting a hearing aid set up, we can help the parents already with all that basic information. 
Um, audiology in South Africa is very good. Our training is good and our audiologists are headhunted worldwide. Oh, wonderful. But it's the after the audiology that we now start to have The after hopes. support. It's the okay. after because no one's got time to go and visit a family in the home. <laughs> Once you've popped the hearing aids on, your next patient comes in. And so that's what we do. All right, let's go for our ad break. When we get back, we'll talk some more. I'm talking to the lovely Professor Claudine Storbeck. She's from Wits University, the uh, Center for Deaf Studies. We're talking about an organization within their unit called High Hopes and it's particularly been set up to assist those parents who don't have any other form of support as far as their little ones, infants and toddlers are concerned who have hearing problems. Stay with us, we'll be talking some more on this issue. We're talking hearing disabilities. We're talking to Professor Claudine Storbeck. She's from Wits University. And we're talking about uh, high hopes. If your child has fallen through the cracks or if you know of a little one who is hard of hearing but the parents cannot afford to have the child seen to, then this is your go-to person and your go-to place. Would I be correct in saying that? You are correct, but also for families who are rich. Money cannot buy you high hope services. Wow. It is the only service of its kind. Okay, let me just ask this one question. Mm. Let's assume that uh, you suspect there's something wrong with your child's hearing yes. and you're a state patient. Take yes. the baby to one of the state organizations. Mm. Are they going to pick up or are they going to refer you on? What's the facilities like at state institutions? You know, the audiologists, again, are world class. They have hearing aids. Um, of various kinds for the various types of uh, hearing losses, both for infants and adults. And some of our state hospitals now even have cochlear implants for children um, and adults that are candidates for that, which not everyone is. So it's wonderful. Um, yeah. So you will get the correct type of care. The only problem is that you'd have to uh, queue up and wait for long periods of time before you get seen to. What is it different that you are offering at yes. High Hopes? Yes. Okay. So once a child has a hearing aid, parents go home and then they might go for once a month or every two weeks they'll go for speech therapy and then check on the audiology, the hearing aids. But no one supports the family through the grief. How do I play with my child? How do I use bath time, cooking time, cleaning time to best develop my child's language, the developmental milestones? How do we help granny, grandpa, the siblings to deal with this child? So we, we do all the stuff that your therapists don't do in the home and just support families through, well, it's a three-year program. So we help oh, you wow. for three years to help your kid get school ready. All right. So you're saying a three-year program yes. and school ready. So I'm now thinking you're talking about a three or a four-year old child that you're going to get school ready. What about a child that hasn't been seen to the child mm. is maybe mm. 10, 12 or even a young adult? Mm. Is there still hope for him at high hopes? Yes. We have had kids refer to us, um, six-year-old, 12-year-olds, 19-year-olds. And sometimes all they really need is an initial meeting. We support the families through it. There's always hope. The brain is so plastic um, that it can learn at any stage. And we then find out what the type of support is that they need and we refer them as soon as we can. The ideal is to have a baby zero to three. Those first three years of life are the core periods of time. And then we help children get into schools if we need to lobby, do a bit of fighting to get them into schools because schools have long waiting lists as well. Well, you know, people, parents are often very uh, put off. They daunted yes. by the red tape and the long waits and mm. the phone calls and the mm. follow-up calls, etc. before they can get themselves or their children seen to. Yes. Isn't it a similar scenario if they um, approach High Hopes? Oh my word, no. You contact High Hopes by WhatsApp, SMS, email, phone us. Um, we have a turnaround time of 48 hours oh, wow. maximum where we will contact you, make an offer of a home visit, which is free of charge. And within a few days, someone will come and see you in your home, 
preferably from a culture or a language that is the same as yours because when you grieve you don't want to speak another language you want to speak your mother tongue when you right. grieve and they come to your home free of charge and just sit and support you through all your questions your anxieties um sharing hopes and dreams and no there's no waiting time there's no long lists and you would also then fit the child out with an appropriate hearing aid if need be no the hearing aids are always managed at your local clinic or in your private health sector at your audiologist they do that and if i can't afford it public health will give you hearing aids for free so you will refer them on oh if you need a referral to a public health sector we will refer you on and we'll even phone the audiologist to tell them you're on your way oh wonderful let's talk sign language yes. you talk about support and you talk about this first three years of support that is yes. so crucial yes. for this child's regular development yeah. Does it mean that the entire family has to go for sign language? How long does that take and where does this happen? Okay. Well, actually, times have changed so significantly that parents have choices. So they can choose to only speak to their child, which is called oral, um, auditory verbal. And if the child has significant access to sound, um, family works really hard and gets a lot of speech therapy, the child could be successful. Parents could choose to use sign language and then everyone learns sign language. We will send someone to your home to teach you sign language for free. Oh, wow. And it will be South African sign language. And how long does that take if someone comes to my home? We will teach you the basics in three sets of workshops, you know, five weeks, five weeks, five weeks. Um, and then we teach you quite a lot of basics. Okay. And then um, you can choose to speak and sign at the same time, which is called signing a spoken language and then there's a new method which is called cute speech where you cue everything that you say because a lot of kids cannot hear everything perfectly so the cueing gives them access to the phonemes it's like your good old shorthand and then they can see the sounds but basically what we encourage parents to do is don't be forced or pressurized to make a decision on this is how I'm going to communicate with my child forever follow your child's lead we will give you all the information and all the options available. And then you just follow your child and see what they're best at. What does the family feel comfortable with? And then we assess your child's language every four months. Because we want to make sure that your child is developing their language. Up to what point? We will develop your child. We will assess language from zero to three years of age. We have milestones for all of those. And we'll be able to tell you at a three to four year level what a child should be saying or signing in whatever language. And all this at no cost to the parent. No cost. Yeah. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. Yes. Um, what else do we need to know? Because I'm also thinking, apart from the grief counselling, yes. and of course with grief comes anger, denial, etc. Mm. Um, so you, ha you, you assist the family through this process. Yes. But you might also get this youngster or someone in that family mm. unit who is carrying this guilt and this anger with them yeah. and are just so closed off to all sorts of interventions. Mm, mm. How do we, in yeah. even though they're closed off, what can you do yeah. to assist the family? You know, sometimes and very, very seldom will a family say, look, we don't want you to visit. Don't come to our home. Then we'll have an SMS conversation with you. And every now and then we'll touch base and give you a phone call. Some families want to Skype, but we'll leave it up to the family and just say, well, look, ask us questions and we'll answer your questions and when families see that we don't push any way it is not to our benefit whether you sign or speak because we make no money out of it and our, our really our aim is just to answer your questions that parents are very open to that very often you'll have a mom and a dad and one of the parents will be a little bit more withdrawn that's okay because we're talking to the family. Sometimes you bring granny and grandpa in and there's significant grief with grandparents. Um, but we build a relationship with you because it's going to take three years of support. Um, and siblings are amazing. And we tell people that it's that, that guilt that people care of. What did I do? Why is my child deaf? Mostly moms. 50% of the case, we don't know why a child is mm -hmm. deaf. It's probably genetic. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it's because of medication. ICU babies, time in the NICU with the medication that they give you, um, things like meningitis, high fever, so many things cause, cause hearing loss and 
for parents to know that it's not anything that they've done. And then in, the, in Africa, we have that misconception that it's often a punishment from our ancestors and it's something evil, which we also teach parents is not the case. And often that is a huge relief to know, well, okay, so I'm not responsible. Um, yeah. What about those parents whom you've worked with yes. over that three-year period, mm. but they're not strong enough to carry on? Mm. Can they still stick with you for another three years, perhaps? You know, we haven't yet had that. Uh -huh. In fact, when the parents say goodbye to us, they don't look back. They don't yearn for us. They don't cry. But is there any yes, ongoing there contact? No. We have a, we, we, we've got a partner program called Thrive, and Thrive is led by parents. So that then becomes a parent-to-parent -parent support, ah. and that is lifetime. Mm -hmm. Those are people you're going to be friends with for the rest of your life, but we're still available. So we've had people contact us when their kids turn 11, when their kids turn 9, or they say, well, you know, do I send him to grade 1 or should I hold him back a little bit? Then they ask us for advice. We get invited to birthday parties. So we see it as we'll be part of your life and your family forever. And all those uh, life-changing decisions that this yes. family is going to be yeah. making. We have yet to be invited to a wedding because our <laughs> kids have not gotten that old, but that's why we, we want to be part of your future. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And let's mm. hope that it does come to that. Yes. In closing then, yeah. what's the very important message and the hope that you want to put out there? You know, we reach 68 countries internationally. Okay. I know High Hopes is in South Africa only, mm. but at least we can give people hope that yes. all is not lost. Your life, oh. it doesn't mean that life has come to a standstill. Totally. Well, the good news is that the model that we've created with High Hopes is the only model of its kind in the developing world. Wow. And it's a model that um, countries like Morocco, Iran, Zimbabwe, um, Namibia have been interested in. So there is always a chance of expanding into other countries to help them. But the main, main message is to say to parents, it is never too late. The way that we've been created, our brains, that plasticity to learn is always available. All we need to do is help you, support you, um, to help your child become the best deaf child they can be and to help the family just be a happy, normal, amazing family. Okay, do we still use the term deaf or is it hard of hearing? Deaf people want to be called deaf mm -hmm. because they don't fear that. Hard of hearing is not a bad word for people who, don't, who are not profoundly deaf, but they don't like the word hearing impaired, hearing loss, deaf and dumb. Those words we've thrown aside because it's more of a pride issue now. You know, I'm a person with deafness, I may be hard of hearing, but none of the loss and impaired words we use. Okay, 12 years, 12-year uh, anniversary being celebrated yes. on Friday. Where to from here with high hopes? You've been doing amazing work mm. up to now, but what's the vision going forward? The vision going forward has already started happening. We now have two referrals of deaf blind babies. <gasps> Oh, how and, do you cope with that? What oh, are you going to do there? That's another whole TV program. Okay. <laughs> you have four-handed sign. There's a whole lot of information of how does one stimulate a child with deaf blindness because they have no curiosity because oh. it's not stimulated. There, there's so much hope for families like that. And then, of course, families with other disabilities in their babies. It's the same type of early intervention. So early intervention is what families and children need to have that intellectual stimulation. And um, so our aim is to expand to all disabilities and to expand up into SADC and other areas. Um, oh my word, so the Centre for Deaf Studies is 20 years old, High Hopes is 12 years old, but I've got a plan for another 20 years, I've got a huge vision, so okay. we're excited. We need to invite you back <laughs> in again to talk yes. about all these amazing plans, but thank you so much for coming in it's and giving us hope yes. through High Hopes, the initiative uh, obviously set up by Wits University yeah. and the Centre for Deaf Studies. Please continue your amazing work. Thank you. Thank you for touching lives in such a positive way. Thank you. And there you have it, Professor Claudine Storbeck talking to us about high hopes and if you were wondering what to do with your little infant or a family member or a friend that you know about, there is hope out there. Please just make the contact with High mm -hmm. Hopes and your life or your family member's life is going to turn around absolutely amazingly mm -hmm. and very, very positively. Thank you for watching. Till next time, a big thank you to the Let's Talk production team. Take care on the roads. And it is Khodafes from me, Julie Ali. <laughs>